Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpuli Kiluruma Mohobe. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. I'm privileged to be able to host you once again. And I have a very, very interesting guest. I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to her. Her name is Mabato Motzamai. We're going to talk about strengthening Botswana's youth through, you know, uh, employment of youth employment, uh, as well as entrepreneurship in the context of SDGs. You'll learn more about SDGs and what SDG 8 means once uh, you get to know our guest a bit more. Uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Nonas. Would you be kind enough to give the guest, uh, to give the listeners uh, an idea of who you are and a little bit of your background? Okay, well, my name is Mabatu Mutamai. Mm. Um, I've been working in the development sector for the past, um, I'd like to say 10 years, but professionally for the past six years. Mm -hmm. um, I specifically work in digital media and communications, as well as project coordination and project management. Okay. Um, I'm based in Botswana, but I've been working remotely since 2015, um, trying to help reduce inequality, but particularly collaborating with other institutions, either non-state actors or even the state, mm -hmm. and helping to reduce inequalities so through Zonedi projects as well as collaboration and, and more so. Working, and re working remotely only became a buzzword recently. You've been doing it since 2015. <laughs> yes. Uh, how has um, that been? I started working remotely as being the founding editor of my blog, The Afrolutionist, mm. which is basically a combination of two words. Afro and solutionist. So mm -hmm. anybody who's African and of African descent that sees problems as opportunities mm -hmm. and creates solutions to help reduce mm -hmm. um, inequalities. Mm -hmm. And essentially the blog talks about that. And mm -hmm. because I was working online and I was ensuring that it's pan-African and it's African oriented, I had to connect with other people across the world who are African and of African descent that mm -hmm. share the same values and to be able to produce the same type of media work. Just before we get into our topic, is the blog still accessible and how does one get hold of it? Yes, the blog is still accessible. You mm. can access the blog on afrolutionist.org. Mm. That is A-F-R-O-L-U-T-I-O-N-I-S-T.org. Okay. okay. All right. Just to help the listener uh, understand what SDG 8 is all about, because that's one of the things we're going to talk. What, 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 what does the acronym mean? And the eight, the number eight, and uh, what is your interest in that subject? Mm. Um, so SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goals. It was brought up by the UN at the end of the Millennium Development Goals. And they noticed that we, it's not just about having specific goals, it's making sure that these goals are sustainable, mm. that they became, they, they, they are, you know, they can work on a cyclical manner mm. and not just focus on relief, but mm. rather on development, on transformation. SDG 8 specifically talks about decent work and economic growth. Mm -hmm. And in the context of Botswana, decent work for young people is a, you know, it's a strong issue. It's, it's around us enjoying economic, social, political, environmental and cultural wellness. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do so, you need to be employed or you need to be an employer of some kind. Mm -hmm. But either way, participating in the economy. Mm -hmm. Describe our educational system, because I'm sure for you to understand uh, these SDGs and how they can be you know, applied in Botswana, you need to be familiar with the educational system. Mm. Describe it and tell us whether there are any deficiencies that you see in our educational system. Mm. I would rather, I'd like to make a comparative statement in mm. understanding the current educational system in Botswana mm. and to the educational system in Zimbabwe in the 80s where I see a lot of people who schooled in Zimbabwe 
have benefited a lot in terms on a pan-African sense. Mm. Um, Botswana's educational system is not necessarily focused on education for production. I mean that as in um, children go to school, yes, to learn, but they are imparted with knowledge that isn't necessarily applied in the school or incentivized through application. Mm. Um, an example of this is uh, my older brother went to school in Zimbabwe to service college. And in the school, they had a bakery. Mm -hmm. um, the, the students who were studying hospitality studies were mm -hmm. also baking mm -hmm. the very bread that people were consuming. Mm -hmm. So it shows that it's not just an academic institution, but they are teaching people what an economic function looks like, mm -hmm. what consumerism and production looks like. And that is what I believe is education for, for, for production, something that needs to be birthed from a prim primary level. In, in school and not necessarily picked up in tertiary level where we see the attach, um, seeking attachments or internships. That would be education for production, but now it comes at such an advanced age, mm. there hasn't been a lot of fundamental um, or it hasn't planting. Been ingrained. It yeah. hasn't been ingrained for us, mm. so it becomes a very um, foreign concept. Mm. Additionally, so that the access to education in terms of tertiary education is found in metropolis areas, mm -hmm. so in your cities. So we're not teaching education for production, particularly in rural areas, and that it can be sustained into advanced growth, growth in rural areas. Yes. We are now teaching that econ the economy must be centric to the local towns and cities, and, we are, and we're taking away the possibility of shared value in our rural areas. When you talk about education for production, is it something that uh, the late Van Rensberg was talking about? Because there was a time when all these brigades were being set up, yes. I think also around the 60s and 70s. Yes. Is this what you're talking about? Essentially, yes. Yes. Um, but it's, it's, it's beyond that. Yes, it, of course it's important to, especially now, mm. um, that we want to be knowledge-based and we want to be manufacturing-based as well. There mm. is a strong importance of brigades. Um, there's still, unfortunately, the assumption of hierarchy, mm. you know, um, in comparison to blue and white collar jobs. Yes. But even beyond that, I, I, I speak from a fundamental level in primary school. How do we then, you know, spotting the artists, spotting the mechanics, mm. spotting the scientists and spotting the engineers, how can that be nurtured through an educational, through an academic yeah. level? Because there are many countries that are facilitating that yeah. in and beyond the continent that do exist. I get the sense that uh, you are saying there's a mismatch between what we're trying to do in terms of education and what the marketplace is saying and what our graduates are having to deal with in the marketplace. Do you see that mismatch as being really entrenched, being endemic, and how can we address it? Yes, I definitely think there's a mismatch. Mm. I think we've seen a, an incre increment of um, business-oriented institutions that come and teach a lot of uh, soft skills, which is as important, you know, business management, marketing and the like. But we're still seeing this growing inequality. That's why I, I refer back to SDGs and the importance of sustainable development goals, that um, there's a lack of alignment towards understanding the inequalities that exist in Botswana mm -hmm. and how we can fill these, uh, reduce these inequalities with an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and furthermore, creating new markets or producing new ma markets and services, mm -hmm. not just for this country, but mm -hmm. looking around um, around us from a regional and global perspective. Mm -hmm. But even Mobotswana, mm -hmm. if you look into you know our villages that are not as densely populated as others, West, and we're looking at all these other areas that have such great for example, a, a good climate and great mm. soil, but we're not seeing the, the potential, mm. you know, of agriculture or soil restoration or land restoration job opportunities come from there. Mm. Instead, we're seeing, you know, children who might not be doing well, babata mm. nangomo shopa and the like, who may be unperforming as well. They don't necessarily know where to go because there's that lack of mentorship or there's that that knowledge gap yeah. really. Um, into what opportunities can exist there. Yeah. And beyond that, and understanding, for example, the creative industry in, yes. in this country mm. and the consumers that of, crea of, of, of the creative in interest mm -hmm. industry beyond oh. entertainment, but just an, on information and knowledge. Yes. There's so much wealth of opportunity of um, knowledge and education, uh, entrepreneurship, mm. and even employment. If you look and understand the diversity of our cultures, mm. and by our tribes, 
and by our lineages mm -hmm. and how people can access that knowledge. Yeah, you, you've still touched on something that overseen. I really want us to go deeper into because I believe that inside every uh, challenge there is an opportunity. Of course. So I'm going to ask you in that context what the potential opportunities are uh, that arise from these, uh, what you described as as gaps, what you described as mismatches. Mm. Um, let's talk about potential opportunities. Um, you know, from the point of view of entrepreneurship and even beyond entrepreneurship, uh, civil society organizations and so on. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I definitely believe that inequalities can be reduced through entrepreneurship, mm. but I'm also aware that human rights cannot be monetized. Mm -hmm. um, cultural rights, they can't be monetized. I think the monetization might be the very thing that creates inequalities to some degrees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we talk about uh, development of new institutionalizations, we need activists and advocates. Mm -hmm. We need um, technocrats who are instilling it. Mm -hmm. We also need people who inform policy mm -hmm. um, to assist in informing that policy. Of course, this is in the context of young people, mm -hmm. but there's a very strong importance of intergenerational um, inheritance of, of knowledge mm. and intergenerational working together to build economic systems. Mm. So it's not necessarily for young people to only be entrepreneurs or mm. young people to just focus on themselves by age, but receiving that knowledge from elders who also see the problem on a generational level mm. of inequality and reducing it. So I think that, you know, NGOs and CSOs need to understand um, the rights that need to be protected from a human, social, political, and mm. cultural level. I think that the private sector, mm. um, be it small SMMEs, being it, be it uh, franchises or foreign businesses mm. establishing themselves in the country, need to be deeply aware of the contextual la landscape that mm. exists, mm -hmm. need to be aware of the skills that exist in the country yes. and ways we can um, appreciate and exploit that. Mm -hmm. And the greatest of all is the state actor, mm -hmm. that of government, that creates an enabling environment um, for economic activity mm. to also affirm the kind of economic activity that can exist in rural areas and that does exist in rural areas and what yeah. and what policies exist to support that, including that of the informal sector. Yeah. So in other words, the government uh, sets the environment mm -hmm. um, for the private sector to thrive. Mm -hmm. But what, what interests me in what you're saying is that you're looking beyond entrepreneurship. I have it in my head that entrepreneurship is the is the answer, but it's not a really a panacea for everything, isn't it? So, it's it's not really the answer for everything in your point in in your view. So, uh, what do you say to people like us who are very set in the mindset of <laughs> thinking that entrepreneurship is really where it's at? I think that they I I just believe in mixed um in a mixed economic function. Mm. Um so not in something that is particularly capitalistic based because mm. I think we see particularly in the global north countries like the US mm. where it's deeply capitalistic based the wellness it reduces the amount of the wellness in index for mm. a person. Mm. I unfortunately forgot the name of the academic who was talking about poverty and the eight factors of poverty, but there is mm. poverty that's beyond economic. There's also poverty of health and of wellness mm -hmm. and of relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we are deeply capitalistic driving, we are reducing the amount of time of wellness and health, yeah. right, in global societies. And I think that mm. um, in more context, they are in Astrana, Yes, entrepreneurship is one solution, mm -hmm. but there are also other various solutions that are also in, uh, that also need to speak on the wellness mm -hmm. um, of the job, the permanence of the job. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are some people who can lead, mm -hmm. but some people lead from the back. They are followers. They are implementers. So I, I often say that we have entrepreneurs, people who are entrepreneurially inclined, but working with an organization, yes. and that entrepreneurs with an E, mm -hmm. there's an I and an E. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on these two groups of people and how they they interrelate in terms of uh, raising raising awareness that we discussed in the context of SDG yeah. eight? I think we have different leadership styles. Yes. Um, there are people who are great at starting something, yes. but don't necessarily have the stamina to see it through to its completion. Mm -hmm. There are people who don't necessarily have, um, who are great strategic thinkers, mm -hmm. right? And those people are usually people who are employed. 
mm-hmm. who can understand the vision but understand the detail and how a company should function um, once given the vision for the organization mm-hmm. and I think that's the difference that you speak of yes. but there are also people who are better off self-employed that work and the, they typically thrive in the gig economy people such as myself yes. who know how to work for a short term period within mm. an organization Mm. Now, within all these three, when we t- look at um, job wellness and mm. permanence, mm. we see a lot of young people who are underemployed. Underemployment is looked at the gaze of internships, unpaid internships, mm-hmm. um, attachments. Yes. Sometimes there's job shadowing. And um, yes, you can be a graduate and you can find a, um, some work of underemployment for some time. Mm. But we're seeing now that, yes, people in their 20s can go into that work, but they now get into their 30s. Mm. And there's still only opportunities for internship yes. competitions of attachments. And the, and that's the gap that I speak of mm. when I say, you know, in terms of the intergenerational gap of sol- solving mm. unemployment, you don't just look at young people under the age of 35. No. We appreciate that beyond 35, there's a life. We appreciate mm. that beyond retirement, mm. there's a life. And mm. yes, people who are retired become entrepreneurs and, you know, develop a higher activity. Yes. So even though I am focusing on youth employment, specifically I understand the outliers Mm -hmm. that enforce and inform Mm. um, youth employment okay all right let me just raise a bit of a controversial subject with you neocolonialism let's talk about the ugly face of neocolonialism in the space that you've you've worked what are your basic observations let's first define the word what does it mean uh, before we talk about the ugly face of neocolonialism Um, I think the, in a nutshell, uh, understanding understanding what autonomy is mm. and what the independence era is. So neocolonialism neocolon- was coined by Kwame Nkrumah um, in the, I think, 1960s towards 70s mm. um, because he noted, he noticed mm. that, you know, the process of independence or the fight towards independence also depended on the colony country re- preparing the, ca- the, the colonized country for independence. Mm. And the preparation is inclusive of um, releasing of um, control mm. politically, mm. economically. Mm. So there was a lot of political release, of course, at the time. So we're seeing more democratized systems. We can form parties and vote and the like. Mm. But we're not seeing as much in terms of economic autonomy. Mm-hmm. And that's why you know certain organizations that were birthed in the colonial era still exist today such as Unilever and the like I don't know I don't know if I should keep mentioning more before I yeah, get yeah. sued <laughs> no, um, we, but we, uh, we get the picture <laughs> essentially neocolonialism focuses on um, just like neoliberalism mm. it focuses on the fact that there's still an impediment or mm. a, a state of control between external factors mm. and us within our autonomy and, avail- and availability to mm. you know function deeply economically in our systems. Isn't this problem more pronounced with the Anglophone, I mean Francophone countries, where they have, for instance, the uh, the pact for the continuation of colonization, where you know up to 50% of their reserves are taken are to taken by Paris and so on. Yes. Is it, is it, are we also suffering uh, to the same extent with, in Anglophone countries? Yes. Um, I think the only difference, I think now I'm going to be taking you back to history. Yes, yeah, so that, <laughs> is, that is helpful. The, the only difference is the nature of rule in the colonized eras. Mm. Um, so there were, there were two forms of rule. There's direct rule mm. and there's indirect rule. Direct rule was largely seen by your Portuguese and your French colonies where they enforced different policies mm. um, of you having to denounce your entire identity as an African. So your culture, your name your political affiliation and in Portu- in Portuguese colonies it was called assimilado mm. which is basically assimilating mm. to the colony of, of, of Portugal so mm. those particular countries mm. um, colonial countries saw the colonies in Africa more like extensions of the country mm. or more like provinces mm-hmm. um, the anglophone countries understood our areas from an indirect perspective so they were they were more they were more interested in the economic um, extraction mm. as to the political extraction mm. and I think that's why Botswana was in a position where it was a protectorate mm. that um, you know they were specific interests because of um, the travel the creating routes of travel mm. in infrastructure mm. um, of transportation rather but there wasn't necessarily 
things that were specific towards our political functioning. Mm. And I think that's why it just seems as if, you know, it's a lot more controlled in the in the areas where yeah. there was direct rule. Yeah. But I think what it makes it more difficult in Anglophone countries is that, is that it was indirect. Mm. It's soft power, mm. it's psychological power. It mm. can't necessarily be touched. Mm. Um, and I think that's the little um, that those are pushback the that we have. Okay. All right. I want us to talk about the sauna. Did you listen to it? Was it on yes. Monday or Tuesday? <laughs> yeah, about yes, early I this did. week. Yes, I know. Uh, what did you pick up from the sauna? Because I'm going to ask you uh, to say something about youth employment or underemployment in the context of the sauna? Yes, um, in the context of the sauna, mm. I think fundamentally how... For those who don't know what the sauna is, we're talking about the state of the nation address. Yeah. In the context of the sauna, I think um, when it comes to youth issues, uh, we see youth issues as a department, mm. even though youth are 51% of the popula population of the country. Mm. Uh, I personally just have an expectation that when we speak on every issue, be it agriculture, be it refugee immigration, be it gender, um, there would be a conversation of youth in percentile because the youth, the youth officers in all these, um, in all these departments. Um, when it comes to employment specifically, there was a lot of conversation about the YDF and um, the percentile in CEDA, how many young people were awarded with how much. And, how many jobs that were created. I think it was close to a thousand jobs yes. over the year that were created, mm. which seems like a high number if you live in Khaburuni, mm. but it's a low number if you consider that this is the state of the nation mm. address. It's not the state of Khaburuni as a city. Yeah. And um, Even I- Even in Khaburuni, 1,000 sounds still a little really small. low. <laughs> yeah. It should be the amount of jobs created in this building. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, think, I think that the nature in which our state has understood mitigating youth employment fundamentally needs an, a transformational lens mm -hmm. that it will not only young people are not responsible for the employment of other young people to solve youth unemployment it is of everybody's interest to ensure the economic inclusion and production for this country to thrive mm. and it's not necessarily only done through ydf or through cda or through lea and other mm you know, state functions, but it, it also includes not necessarily putting the, 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 the burden on young people who are entrepreneurs or who are seeking entrepreneurship, but it also includes creating a quota system at least for organizations that want to work in Botswana, organizations that exist uh, existing in the country. In other words, legislation. That, yes, of course. Mm. Um, unapologetic policy and legislation that is inclusive of young people in mind because this is a young because population. It happens in other countries. Of course, and we are becoming we are a young population and we're, be, and we're becoming even younger. Mm. And it, they, they need to just be an, a constant unapologetic conversation on youth inclusion you, on that level. You, you describe the, the government's view as somewhat myopic. So I'm wondering whether that is a result of not involving the youth in the actual policy creation process mm, is that course. is that is that the problem i think it's one of the issues i actually find it very interesting when i look at the independence era how mm. many young people were in leadership um, mm. when our countries were birthed mm. and how many young people are not in leadership in our countries today because yeah. they're still within those positions yes. there's just a lack of culture of passing down knowledge mm. and it's 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 quite unfortunate and given responsibility and granting responsibility mm. that's what we do and I think that's when I say um, the need to inform all our rights, even mm. culturally, our cultural mm. rights, rights need to be seen in leadership spaces mm. so that they grant a passing of knowledge and a passing of training that is sincere within um, the state level and is sincere even within um, the non-state level. It's clear to me that you've given this a lot of thought. So I want to hear from you what specific uh, potential recommendations you have for state actors mm. in this regard to to have some sort of paradigm shift when it comes to youth i think it's openness mm. um botswana hasn't ratified the youth charter the african youth charter not yet no <laughs> we're, not, we're not even a signatory <laughs> really so and the reason for that I am not sure. There's also there, there are all these assumptions that you know because you're practicing something, you don't have to ratify in it. But I think if you're practicing it, it should be okay for you to ratify to keep yourself accountable. Mm. Um, 
but I think the that... The African Youth Charter. Yes, the African okay. Youth Charter, developed by the I hope you are listening, government, ratify <laughs> it. <laughs> I think there's that. Um, so I believe that in many ways, mm. there are young people in offices and in, in government, mm. but a lot of them have bottled, have very little power, or speaking mm. power because of the amount of ageism, mm. um, which is found within government offices. Explain ageism. Um, ageism in this context is the idea that uh, intellectual intellectual value and knowledge incentives and knowledge value is based on age and amount of experience mm -hmm. uh, as a quantity and not necessarily the quality of the experience that you have by your diversity inclusion of age I agree, I agree essentially with that. Um, so your recommendations so yes my recommendations of course the first one is the ratification of the African Youth Charter because it's inclusive of jobs and employment um, on a state level but even on a non-state level for civil society is to really engage in understanding your, the needs of the young people that live in your in the areas, particularly in rural and peri-urban areas. That's deeply important mm. because a lot of our inequality is coming from not having, from a lack. Mm. And that lack is birthing different forms of violence. Mm. Um, on the private sector level, for older you know more mature and entrepreneurs such as yourself mm -hmm. to really be open up to opening up to mentor other young people other young entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who don't necessarily have the experience of production or the culture of production mm -hmm. to help develop their mind and you know and not see them less about as, as does the state actor then legislate mentorship how do how do you then practically I'm Bring not, I, 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 I don't necessarily, I can see, yes, some things, of course, are dependent on policy and legislature. Mm. But sometimes policy and legislature depends on the activity that happens yes. in person. We need to create value and show value proposition. Mm. Working in informal and formal areas, the need to create a governing system for something mm. specifically. Mm. And so those are, those are the mechanisms that I think need to work. So yeah. it's not only just to wait for government or to wait for CSO to yeah. take government to task. Well, the that takes us to my next question, which is your recommendations for non-state actors. Yes. We're talking NGOs, we're talking the private sector, we're talking even entrepreneurs. Yes. Um, so my recommendations, I think, are also opportunities. Mm. Um, we see a lot of uh, global opportunities for coming from the international labor, or labor organization that want to help fund specific programs and projects that help reduce unemployment. Mm. For CSOs and for NGOs, young people um, who come from various areas across this country still need help in understanding um, job readiness, mm. preparing them for interviews, boosting their confidence skills, boosting other soft skills. These mm. are opportunities in which mm. the CSOs can engage mm. with government. For self-employed persons or people who are looking towards employment, if you're still studying, if you have the privilege of being a tertiary student at this point, or even if you're out of school, learn how you can collaborate with other people within your classroom um, and doing project work together. Because that, not necessarily that you'll be an entrepreneur, but mm. you're teaching yourself productivity, that you may also be productive in the in the in the mm. in the office space. Okay, and just for those who might not know, CSOs mean CSOs are civil society organisations okay. or non-governmental organisations. Okay. And in the context of Botswana, how strong are these organisations, and um, how do you believe they can be strengthened to mm. play a bigger part? Um, I think CSOs are, they have an opportunity to be a lot stronger. Mm. Uh, their strength, this is going back to neocolonialism in a way, their strength is largely dependent on the donors that are coming from the global north. Mm. Okay. And um, depending on, and that's why sometimes depending on who is in power on a political level in the global north tends to affect the activities of the CSOs because the money is either Mm. The pockets are either tightened or widened. Yeah. And there's an opportunity for them to engage with people who are in the country, mm. to engage with partnering with private organizations um, who do, um, what is it called, CSR work, mm. <laughs> and also to engage Use with a lot other. of acronyms. Sometimes you should just of course. <laughs> explain. CSR work means? Corporate Social Responsibility yes, Work. Yes, okay, yes. yeah, okay. <laughs> The, the word actually escaped me. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so for for those um, uh, non-governmental organisations to partner mm. or collaborate with private institutions to yeah. help, you know, inform some of their programming, because we need to move away from working as a silo 
mm. to expanding our own ecosystem. Mm. And collaborations are the fundamental way of how we can expand our ecosystem. Okay. I want to speak to something which is very close to your heart, which is Afro solutionism <laughs> or Afro -sol being an Afro solutionist. Yes. I got it. <laughs> so explain that word, how it came about, and what uh, prompted you to. To, to set it up and what is it about? So the Afrolutionist. Yeah. Um, so I birthed the Afrolutionist um, in 2015 um, because I was doing a lot of work in the media. I was a freelance writer mm. and I realized that there's some, you know, conversations that don't make it to the papers that I'd like for them to make to the papers. Mm. Um, and these conversations are seeing that um, the issues that we have in Botswana are very similar to the issues that we have in Namibia, mm. which are similar to the issues that we have in Ethiopia. Mm. And we're not, we're having them in such quiet silos, but we mm. need to have them collectively together. Because there are other people who are providing solutions in Kumasi in Ghana or Kaiso in Uganda that can help us in Botswana. And there are some things we're doing in Botswana that can help other people mm. in, in other places. So I developed this blog called Essentially, it was the African solutionist, which is very long. Mm. And then I put it together as the Afro solutionist. Mm. And we just have this one belief um, that all in enlightened minds can change the world. Mm. And you can only reach enlightenment through knowledge acquisition, humility to get the knowledge acquisition. And any, any significant accomplishments you are proud of? Yes. So the Afro solutionist has um, adopted SDG 17, yeah. which is the 17. How many are they? They're 17. Eight. <laughs> Oh, you jumped from 8 to 17. Yeah, the 17 you sustainable to development yeah. goals. <laughs> yeah, the 17. Yeah. yeah, so I adopted the last one, which is partnership for the goals. Mm. So the Afrolutionist, by its nature, is a collaborator. Mm. And uh, we collaborated with seven other organizations in creating the Botswana Youth Jobs Fair. This mm -hmm. is where SDG comes into play. Mm. Um, and the Youth Jobs Fair is a platform where we provide job readiness trainings and we also provide hiring activity. It's a one week fair. So, um, Three of the three days is for job readiness and two is for mm. um, hiring activity. And we've managed to employ many people from So you're linking up employers with employ potential employees? Essentially. Okay, when and is the next one? opportunities. So now in the season of COVID, it's very difficult because even the very employers are now retrenching. Mm. Um, but we're hopeful that we can, we can be able to host one soon once restrictions are lifted. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, you, you raised the issue of COVID. Do you, how has it affected you particularly in terms, as an entrepreneur, as a more like a social entrepreneur? And what strategies have you been put in place to overcome the, the shackles of COVID, if I could call it? <laughs> I think um, COVID has definitely deeply affected me because um, the nature of the evolutionist is we work remotely and we meet with the people that we work with. So immediately when there was a travel, um, a global travel lockdown or travel ban, the evolutionist had to rethink its way and how we can work with each other. Mm. So we took a step back, which is what I encourage other organizations to do if, 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 if needs be, mm. and are currently restructuring ourselves into being um, not just remote, but ensuring that there is activity that functions in those specific areas okay. across the continent. As we get closer to the end, uh, call to action. What is your call to action as a sort of an overarching message over, over what we covered? Uh, the overarching message, of course, is just to listen to young people and be comfortable with engaging mm. with young people. And from the young people's side, to also listen to um, advice or knowledge or instruction that's coming from various areas in terms of collaboration of projects to help reduce mm. unemployment. Mm. But the biggest thing is that where you are right now, whether it is in a peri-urban area, mm. there are potential opportunities in your area. It may seem extremely difficult, but they are there. And it's important for you to create an economy in that area because that is how an area urbanizes itself. Mm. That's how an area develops, by your participation in it. Absolutely. Um, aligning to, to your values to SDGs, is this an intellectual exercise or is it a practical exercise? It's both. And how does it work? <laughs> um, aligning your values to SDGs, I think it's, it starts off intellectual. Mm. Of course, you have to read what the SDGs are. You mm. need to read what the markers are and then you link your company mm. or your organization into understanding how you fit in. Even a restaurant, mm. 
provides it is SDGs if you think about wellness, right? Mm-hmm. If you think about employment, mm. um, and that's the intellectual process. Mm. Practicalizing it is the activity that you will draw in your business mm-hmm. that are saying this talks to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. I'd like you to, this is a bit of a surprise. <laughs> yeah, you get a chance in this show lately to ask me as a host one question, any question you want, obviously within within bounds <laughs> and um, that that's your opportunity yeah I'm interested to know in your nature of work because I believe you've been an entrepreneur for quite some time um, what do you believe because I mean I'm sure when you were younger youth unemployment wasn't much of an issue what do you believe are the markers that led to this position and how do you believe we can get back to a point where there's more economic inclusion that's sincere well I really just want to copy and paste what you've said because uh, you it's 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 um the problems are not just with government mm. the problems are i think we lost sight of our, our roots in terms of culture if you look back uh, prior to independence there was no such thing as unemployment mm. there was no such things as underemployment there was always a way of people getting themselves engaged and getting themselves into the system and if some of the things you said about our culture being rich um, in terms of, uh, you know, an average Motswana had three homesteads yes. or three places, Moraka, Masimu. you know, Masimu and at, at the, you know, Kohai in the village. So, and, and people were, were, had seasonal activities around those places. So sometimes I, I, I echo the words of Re Kualahobi, uh, which he mentioned at the funeral of the late the late, uh, you know, second president, Dr. Masiru, Sekut Mithila Masiru, when he said, because I think if we go back to where we had and really rediscover some of our old ideas, for instance, let's talk about the original Ipeleke. Yes. When Sirat had talked about self-reliance and his Ipeleke, he wasn't talking about Maguinya and Dipapak. He was really talking about getting yourself involved and rising and getting, getting your hands dirty and doing something for yourself. So I think we need to, um, to go back to the crossroads. I may not have the, 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 the silver bullet in terms of solution, but are having uh, engagements such as we're having and re-involving the youth. Um, I, I'll just let you know that those youth, those four, are waiting for me to mentor them. Oh, so good. it is an effort every Thursday and sometimes Sunday, I get together with youth. I want to see more business people mm. doing this. Actual physical activity of mentoring and bringing people along. Mm. So that is one way. Uh, I don't know if I've answered the question. You've done quite good. Thank, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it was a tough question. <laughs> now, look at the camera and share with the listener uh, one powerful, inspirational message uh, as a takeaway. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, okay. I believe my only message is one, participation. Mm. I can understand that some things can happen in your social or personal life that can take you away from participating economically. But let's get back into those particular areas and, be, and see ways in which we can assert our own power to help develop this, develop our country economically, develop our country socially, and being proud of our cultures, our respective cultures that we do have, because those are the core things that will help us become a prosperous country. How do people get hold of you? Can you share your contact details? If people want to carry on this conversation further or want to take advantage of some of your services? Yes, I mean, you can definitely reach out to the Afrolutionist. Mm. Um, it's A-F-R-O-L-U-T-I-O-N-I-S-T dot org. Mm. Um, you can just search the Afrolutionist and you'll find our Facebook, our Instagram and our Twitter. Um, as I said, we are reinstitutionalizing, but you can still engage with us towards the end of the year and for next year and beyond. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure Thank talking you. to you. I've been so enriched. I want to applaud you and to recognize you. Keep on keeping on. Thank you so much. Mm. <laughs>